what would an artist and a psychiatrist talk about? Well, they would sit there, you know, and they will have a chat on a magic carpet and their mind would wander. Um, the project is called Magic Carpet um, and this is the carpet <laughs> in question. So I approached Philip um, because I was told I had ADHD and I thought, oh, what is ADHD? Gosh, and what do I do with that information? And then I said, well, that's interesting because currently I'm studying this thing called mind wandering. And so mind wandering, it's like a phenomena that we all experience, like our mind wanders in different ways. And people with ADHD have a very particular type of mind wandering. Their thoughts on the go all the time. They jump and flick from one thing to another. And in the, in the art world, mind wandering is quite an established strand, whether you call it mind wandering or not. It's this idea of, you know, roaming, wandering, letting your minds go free, putting disparate things together, drawing different connections together. So I thought, oh yeah, there's definitely a conversation in there to be made. ADHD is a, is a, is a, is a spectrum, you know, it's a dimension. Mm -hmm. And we're really just talking about the, the so, so sort of severe end of, of a normally distributed trait. And it's a kind of disorder that some people can do really well in life and, and it's really interesting to understand more about yeah. how people can make use of their ADHD. Yeah. It's exactly. precarious, I think that's yeah. how I would describe it, um, but I think somehow I'm able to channel a lot of that kind of tension into my artwork because if I didn't have that, what do I do with that energy? What do I do with that kind of, that thing that's going on in me all the time? So the carpet opens up a kind of a poetic space, a productive space to generate creative collisions and productive antagonisms across disciplines. I like to call them a safari of mind-wandering beasts. Mm -hmm. A lot of these animals, there are lots of animals, yeah. a lot of these animals are inspired by um, children who have drawn animals when I asked them, what does your brain look like? What's inside your mind? And they would draw these Amazing so animals. We had this open day in the SGDP building, yeah, that's right. and you walked around with a little tray full yeah, of these yeah, badges, yeah. That's right, yeah. and then getting people to draw their mind wandering. Yeah. And what animals does it look like? And, yeah, and we've I got a collection of drawings. That's right. And what I find amazing, what I discovered is because uh, you made it on a digital yeah, that's right, on program, an iPad. and then I discovered that each stitch on this is one pixel, it and says, it's also got yeah. texture. That's right, yeah. Which you is can interesting, touch it. but I don't know how to interpret it. No, I don't know how to interpret no. it either. <laughs> this evening, we are having a speed dating event at the South London Gallery. Um, well, it's part of the Arts and Mind Festival, mm -hmm. so we're going to have experts in the arts and the mind. And what's nice about a speed dating situation is that you go through many people in a short space of time and you can have one-on-ones with these experts. You can talk about the mind, talk about the arts. And the starting point would be the badges. So people will be, people will be choosing the badges that they want to wear. Mm. And what does yours say? Mine says easily distracted. It's one of the ADHD symptoms. And I made a set of five. They are five, yeah. actually five of the 18 criteria in something called the DSM-5. And that has 18, a list of 18 criteria for ADHD. And the five that I've chosen are my favorite ones. So easily distracted, running around, talks excessively. <laughs> That's me, talks excessively. <laughs> So, so, okay, so we've got psychiatrists here. Um, I just want to have a feel of who we have in this room tonight. So, um, friends from the cultural and creative sector. Oh, okay, quite a few of us, great. And who swears by the social model of disability? Ooh, okay, great, fantastic. And who identifies as neurotypical? Well, well this was a fabulous talk. And one of the things that really hit home for me tonight in, in thinking about mind wandering was this kind of like notion that came out very strongly between mind wandering and creativity. But people have been telling us, oh, I feel so me in these events. And for me, that's very touching for so many reasons. For me, it is about opening things up. But interestingly, if you follow the social model of disability, that's probably what most disabled people anyway would say. We see disability as a societal construct, not about a medical impairment. 
But the idea of a collaboration between an artist and a psychiatrist is particularly interesting because one almost imagines from an external viewpoint that those perspectives are so vastly different. Um, you know, Kai uh, works to the social model of disability, sees how impairment is part of our identity and the barriers within society. But obviously for uh, uh, you know, somebody working from a medical perspe perspective, they're looking at what's wrong with somebody. Uh, that's the kind of base starting point. So anything that softens that narrative, these conversations, the artwork, the workshops, the, the other elements help us all come to a much more nuanced understanding of art and of different ways of being in the world. ADHD is still not there in terms of um, the level of public consciousness. So I think if you even just bring that out there, make it visible, and that's why I think as an artist I make things visible. Just to, to display it, to get people to talk about it, to notice it, you know, to get those conversations going. And, um, but Kai's approach was really kind of slightly novel as well because it was more about using art as a type of research in its own right, sort of generating kind of new ideas and new discourse. So it wasn't just about disseminating ideas, but actually making people really think about it and come up with new ideas. And, we, and, and what's interesting is that Philip has been so open to this whole process and we are able to kind of be very experimental and very you know, just, just kind of finding things out as we go along. Mm -hmm. And it is this idea of, okay, what happens when two disciplines come together? Mm -hmm. In my case, it is art. In, in Philip's case, it's molecular psychiatry and ADHD specifically. But from there, as a starting point, to then talk about, you know, our different viewpoints or similar viewpoints about it. And also, then, if you zoom out, then we're also having a conversation about our respective disciplines, between our disciplines. From Roman to Elizabethan to Jacobean to Neoclassical to Victorian and beyond, this bath exemplifies a London whose meanings are constructed through chronological layers of the material and the imagined. Does the echoey stuff come over in the recording okay? Because that's one of the first things I liked about this place. I thought this is such a lovely space. And it's not at all what you expect. Um, and you first come in and you can see that when people visit it. They kind of go, oh, Roman bath? What's this? You know. But the more you get the feel of it, the more you just like it. I decided that what I was happiest doing was responding to particular sites that were historically and culturally and socially interesting. And that's one of the reasons why I was really pleased to get the chance to work with the bath, in the bath, about the bath. <laughs> Out of the blue, uh, here was somebody saying, I'd love to compose and sing a song in the Roman bath. It's a wonderful idea, singing in the bath. Because actually misinterpretation is so much part of the story of this place. It's not a Roman bath, but people have passionately wanted to believe it was, and they've spun all kinds of confirmatory fantasies around that. Uh, so fantasy, wishful thinking, the will to believe, uh, strange connections are themselves part of the history of the bath and it's precisely that that you were focusing on and pulling out. And I think I, I've particularly valued um, the, the, the kind of freedom of imagination that you've brought to it, that precisely by cutting loose from academic propriety in a funny kind of way you're actually being more faithful to the history of this place because the history of the place is so much to do with wishful thinking and fantasy. That's a nice way of putting it. We did do this little um, installation display thing in one of the cabinets where we did intentionally mix up um, fact and fiction about the bath using some genuine archival stuff and some totally fabricated things. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of everything. It's, it's genuine advertising material from the 19th century 
uh, and perfectly straight-faced uh, 20th century sort of children's magazine material about bars. You know the way it works in museum displays, you just automatically think, oh this must be right because it's here in a glass case. The authority of the label. Yeah, and, you know, you just accept it. In fact, the only genuine thing in here is the brick, which is a real brick from the Roman bath. We were having fun, we were playing around, but the, there's, a, there's a serious kernel because false claims and fantasies uh, and confident myths about the bath are so much part of, of what it has been. You know, as Mike was saying, there's lots of episodes in the history of the bath where, you know, people have really tried to prove totally improbable things <laughs> and published books and all the rest of it, yeah. Um, it's just to give people a chance to sit and reflect on the bath and sit quietly and listen, get the feel of the place. All this could be termed virtual reality. But what is really real is that you're sitting here in the space which is virtually a Roman bath, with an indexical image and recorded sound. Oh, I love working with headphones. The sound goes right straight into your head and you're in a little world of your own with the sound and you make the pictures yourself. What I suppose I'm trying to do and get other people to do is to allow the bath to speak to us in the here and now, not just about its history, but how people experience it now as it is. I think another thing that I appreciate particularly was the, the range of different media that, that you were using. I just tried as many experimental things as I could. I mean, I like the way that a place like this and a residency like this allows you to go off and just explore, you know, go off at a tangent and it's never really going to be wrong. You've, in a whole series of different ways, you have brought the senses back, enlivened the space in that way. Uh, because you know, the, the, there was the video, there was the audio, uh, but there was also simply the, the exercise of getting people in here and getting them to, to experience the curious, rather damp, musty atmosphere. But that itself is, is part of what the bath is and what it has been. The bath is great. I forgot how much I liked it till I came back today. Bria is uh, the Brooke Roberts Innovation Agency. We work on materials innovations. Um, we're design and technology led, uh, but I personally am from originally a medical background. Uh, I was a radiographer in the NHS for nearly two decades. So my personal journey is sort of at the crossroads of science and fashion. Uh, there are a lot of problems to be solved in the world and a lot of them are rooted in materials. You know, they range from uh, design, fashion, waste. So we set about trying to design and create materials that will solve some of those problems. Uh, so we end up working with people like Dr. Matthew Howard at King's College London. So we're in the Wheatstone Innovation Lab. This is a laboratory space that we've set up at King's for our students. Uh, we have currently our artist in residence, Brooke, and she's running a workshop in knitting. So we're very interested in all kinds of making, not only the very high-tech stuff, because we think that having a knowledge of the skills at all levels 
of making sort of gives a more rounded understanding of, of how you make things, basically. We're in our second workshop of five. Um, we're still focusing on hand knitting techniques and then throughout the workshops in the coming months we'll then be transferring those techniques onto domestic knitting machines and then we're going to move on to digital knitting techniques where things get more industrial and where we can start to look at wearables and more complex knit structures. So try and always centre your knitting, so if you want to do 40 stitches you do 20 each side of zero. Now part of the reason that we're doing workshops here in the Wheatstone Lab is that we also see an educational benefit to it, uh, both from the perspective of giving our students the ability to learn a new skill. The people in here are physicists, mathematicians, chemists and informat informatics people. So none of them probably thought to themselves, well I'm going to learn about how to, to knit in, in my courses. The fact that we're able to sit here and, and explore the craft in this way, on this level, is a great thing. It's sort of therapeutic and fun. We can also take it to a whole other scientific level once we move through to the digital aspects of knitting and then really apply it scientifically. Um, so for me, I, I think it's an incredibly interesting, fun, but also a, a powerful um, craft and tool. It's the first piece of machine knit ever made in the Wheatstone Lab. Uh, alongside of that, we worked in the labs with uh, Matthew and Samuel to create machine-made um, knitted sensors. Uh, so I guess it was twofold. There was a creative and, and playful element through the workshops, but then we were applying much more of the, um, the structured and uh, machine knit um, techniques to the sensors and trying to deliver a specific outcome. So on the table here you can actually see uh, the prototype sensor that we've developed. This consists of essentially a soft fabric, knitted fabric sensor. Okay, So this is a, quite a unique way of being able to sense pressure. But I want to tell you something about the the context of this work and where we're uh, hoping to take it. We've been looking at whether we can use this kind of technology to create smart footwear. Um, so this actually is a very early attempt to make an insole shaped uh, sensor that could go, potentially go into uh, a medical orthotic boot or something similar. So um, in, for example, the treatment of diabetes, one of the issues that, that uh, you know, people with diabetes faces, face is the uh, lack of circulation to the foot. Um, so what we hope to do is to be able to measure, for example, where are the particular points on the foot where, you, where shoes or other footwear might be applying pressure and causing the circulation to be even worse and therefore potentially predicting where an ulcer might occur or even an amputation. Um, and... Yeah, so we're, we're currently looking to see if whether this technology might be feasible for that kind of um, uh, application. Personally, um, I've just found it very inspiring, actually. They're very focused um, on what they're doing. It's very um, rigorous. Uh, and that teaches us something about our practice as well, that if we want to solve problems using design, we need a, a de degree of rigor around that. Within the project, that we've been, we've been running with Brooke. Um, we got to explore different ways in which you can use knitting to create substrates, um, which is something new for us. Usually, you know, within the context of engineering, you don't get access to those kinds of hand skills, which you know, people in the crafts and the arts world um, you know, work with every day. You know? And most of that knowledge and, and um, you know, uh, understanding of how fabrics work is captured in people's fingertips, it's not really captured in textbooks. So that, for us that's, that's the main value of, of doing these collaborations with, uh, with artists. To solve the world's problems we need to be more creative, we need to be more innovative and that means drawing on a broader skill set um, and having conversations beyond what we know within our disciplines. You know, this is where things are going, um, so our residency I think is a key a key um, kind of part of, of that evolution, actually, of, of professions and of the careers of the future.
discovered that we're each in our own, let's say, covert ways, not quite disobedient creatures, even though in order to keep our heads above water in the public domain, we appear to be, <laughs> to be quite obedient. Quite obedient. <laughs> yes. I guess the, the ground in common was disobedience, right? <laughs> That's what it turned out to be, didn't it? I think what we were both intrigued about was uh, how do we, you know, how do we inspire an, uh, an idea of disobedience to the public, but also through both our practices, looking at informatics and, and um, intelligence, both in a, an algorithmic way, but also in a physical way. In computer science, and in informatics in particular, we tend to think of normative systems and agents as things that have to be obedient. Yes. And as soon as they're not behaving as predicted or as specified, then this is an error. And what I think you and I both thought was that um, there could be options or opportunities for creativity both, both constructive and destructive, um, but surprising opportunities within, within disobedience that we shouldn't try and rule it out entirely. I, I found as breaking from an engineer into becoming a designer that practices engineering, disobedience helped me a lot in my process and like bringing digital tools into the physical. And I felt intrigued to, to bring this my experience into Richard's world, in a way, uh, and see whether we can break some of these frameworks and norms uh, in the informatics department, I guess. Yes, this is a prototype upon which we built. Uh, where you see a variation of skins, so this is a metal skin, but used robotic welding. So there was actually here, in a way, a pattern, an algorithm that had uh, a different pattern of where the weld points would go to create a particular flexing behavior and like a particular density. If you can imagine this being a whole wall which then flexes open into a spring. And just by guiding, basically, instructing the robot to create a particular pattern of weld points. Um, it, the, you then tune the behaviour of this material and give it a particular way in which it will move and flex. In a way, uh, this is sort of a disobedient corridor. It's, it's, you know, it's, it breaks our perception about space, about, about structure and architecture being static and how we relate to space and our ability to, to morph and modulate space. We're not really used to be able to, to move a whole wall uh, just with our weight made out of steel. We're not uh, used to be able to reconstruct the space around us. And this gives a very, the intelligence in it lies in its materials, in, it, in the construct of its structure, in the mechanism underneath it, and which allows you to suddenly experience space in a very different way. Create a wave. In a way, uh, in our exploration, I guess, I stretched it in the completely opposite direction of how do we look at intelligence and its disobedience from a completely physical and uh, in many ways you could say analog but an intelligence an artificial intelligence still which is material and structural and to then compare it to a more opaque um, construct of an algorithmic intelligence and um, having a space being disobedient within that and how having the human being a disobedient actor within that space. Yes, yeah, sure. As the engineer here, you've got a, a device which is obviously very physical indeed and um, capable in some sense of, of disobedience or at least unexpected behaviour, shall we say. Where we found our spot is to inspire people to disobey, to discover, but also to, to discover ourselves what are disobedient constructs in our in the in the context of our of the intelligence that we create. 
Yes. Yeah, I think breaking the mould is something that is, is an interesting idea here. That we tend to be very linear and progressive in informatics. We tend to go on doing things roughly the way we've always done, with little tweaks and improvements and so on, but not really step changes uh, in particular. And working with Nasir gave us the opportunity, perhaps, to introduce some really fresh thinking and to introduce um, the possibility of doing something that was really very different um, from what we've been doing before um, in terms of just the way that we think about problems in informatics and the way to go about solving them. Uh, my name is Teresa Albor. Uh, I'm a artist who is really interested in process-based work um, or research-based work um, where the experience is the piece. Um, I also do a lot of work where I engage with other people who aren't identified as artists. I came across this, um, this drug called naloxone, which is an antidote to heroin overdose and how it can kind of bring people back to life. And this idea of bringing someone back to life um, is really fascinating to me. I knew Dr. Sally Marlowe and I spoke to her about this. And lo and behold, this concept of looking at uh, heroin use or opiate use and its intersection with in unconditional love uh, just seemed like the right moment, the right thing to focus on. And I think what was interesting about that for us in the addictions department as I was in then was that you know of all the projects that you could have chosen naloxone to a lot of the scientists working on it seems like a very pragmatic drug and the idea of linking that with emotion and something so universal and so unfathomable yet completely recognizable at the same time that was the thing I think that when you came to us with that idea we were like this is really good because you've brought in people you've worked with them you've directed them you've been part of performance with them or you've staged performances uh, with them films I, and that I think has been really um, an interesting thing to watch that the way that you collaborate because we talk as academics about collaborating and we don't always do it in the way that we think we're doing it so watching you do it has also been a really interesting process, I think. Well, the, the actual piece involves conversations between myself and people with lived experiences of both unconditional love and um, heroin use. That is the piece. But it has provoked me, as it often does, inevitably, to... There are manifestations of that. There are... I've made things based on what I've been thinking, which have been performance work or videos um, or the use of stills from videos, sound pieces. I stumbled upon this idea of the lullaby as a um, metaphor for unconditional love, which gave me this kind of rich entry into sound. I, I was lucky enough to find people who could both enact or bring to the surface rage that they have felt personally, but also could sing a tender lullaby. And that's really, for me, worked as a way of kind of um, making this happen in my work, this, this emotion that's hard to conjure up uh, through the stark reality of seeing the same person sing something so tenderly but then have a level of rage that seems in complete contradiction. Um, so it began with this woman playing the violin and singing a really beautiful lullaby. Um, and I could see that people saw it as a classic performance where they were kind of being entertained um, and then another woman started singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star from another place in the audience. Twinkle Twinkle Little Star 
how I wonder what you are um, and then people were smiling it's like oh we're gonna hear a lot of nursery rhyme nice songs but then her singing got really angry and she really subverted and distorted the song I think there's a kind of way of working that a lot of artists are interested in, including me, which is to take us to places that we don't want to go to or we've never been to um, and then see what happens. I don't steer away from work that involves risk, that involves uh, feelings that are... Um, something that are challenging me or challenging anyone else. We soon grew used to living entirely in these hypersaturated worlds. No one wanted to stay in what was now known as the Blandscape. The Blandscape was a dark place where you visited to fix a setting or finish an upgrade. I guess, I guess what interests me is just, you know, the world that we're living in right now is changing really, really fast. And I don't think anybody really knows quite where it's going. And we've had a lot of dystopian science fiction, and a lot of it's been really great over the past years. But I also think that that's sort of directed uh, the way that technology's moved. So I've always been interested in the intersection between arts and technology. And I'm particularly interested with robotics because as the AI and technology gets more sophisticated and gets more in the public eye, people's impressions of robotics become important. And a lot of the stories about robots are things coming from Hollywood and in films which are very untrue to what's actually being done in the research community. So I was very interested in working with Rebecca to be able to tell stories that are faithful to the real research and the real motivations of actual robotics researchers. Maybe that's why we were too distracted to notice in time, when we could still perhaps have made a difference. I think one of the things that we found through this project was that most engineers and computer scientists are really lousy at explaining what they do to people who are not engineers or computer scientists. So, in fact, that's one of the reasons why we went ahead and developed the six word story workshops for this audience because we wanted to give the um, PhD students and postdocs and actually even some lecturers the opportunity to sort of learn how to express what they're doing in very high level simple terms. So, the roots of engineering and technology I think really kind of comes from uh, the ability to imagine. With the workshop uh, one of the ideas was to get people to sort of re reverse engineer things that are uh, in our everyday lives. So I had them uh, describe the internet without using any of the sort of words associated with the internet. Um, and we came up with some really good ones, like um, was made for war, now shows cats. And these are all kind of ways of, of describing what it does and what it is and how it affects us in our daily lives without actually saying, you know, it's, it's, it's about communication and satellites and information being transmitted around. So using the same concept, we, we then transitioned into their own research. It's what story does, and, and challenging them to become interested in what you're doing. So, so it's it was getting imagine. people who are researchers and are working all day in, in labs and working with very complex topics and uh, very abstract subjects and very technological subjects to think about their work in less jargon-heavy, more communicative, uh, more fun ways. And it's really incumbent upon scientists and academics, I think, to come up with ways of communicating to other people. Uh, you have a space that isn't necessarily just about your work, but it's also about listening to other people and, and creating something. So uh, that creation, that process of creation allows you to kind of generate ideas. So one thing that's been really helpful for me is thinking a lot more about public engagement and the impact of the kind of research that we're doing um, in my lab. Uh, we worked together to do this exhibit of the robotics research going on around King's and that really forced us to think about what are the um, essential elements of the research that we want to communicate and how do we communicate that to a public audience, and but that's helped me as I've you know sort of moved through the rest of the year to think about 
ways in which, as I write about my research, both for a technical audience and a more popular audience, how can I capture those ideas and, and communicate them more clearly? The visual work uh, is a series of collages that's inspired by pop arts and uh, Dadaist movements in the 1960s. And um, really it's um, using adversarial images, uh, images which are misclassed by artificial intelligences, which um, to us look like just really strange and beautiful patterns. But an AI will look at this and classify it with 100% certainty as being a dog or a cat or a pancake or a rifle or whatever. So. so the kinds of things that Rebecca's interested in are exactly these false things. They're things that the network thinks they're cups, but they're not actually cups. And when we as humans look at them, we might say, this looks nothing like a cup. Why would the network think it's a cup? Well, there's something inherent in the arrangement of the pixels in the image that makes the function inside the network think they're cups, even if they're not actually cups. So it's almost like a, a hallucination on the part of a, a neural network, like they're seeing something which isn't really... This is how I thought of it anyway, in, yeah. in, in a, a kind of poetic way. I think that the idea that the AI is taking on its own, its own force and becoming its own thing, an entity almost, that we don't really understand is, is very much a part of the work that I've done. I think there's a lot of black boxes, um, especially when it comes to neural networks and deep learning, and we don't really understand what's going on. We've got AI that talk to each other in languages that we don't quite understand. But what happened next, no one had anticipated. Like a primitive map, the edges of our world began to curl up. Um, it's, it's been really, really fantastic to be able to, I think, have ideas and then to come and just talk about them freely with people in the research groups. I know that they're always going to have something interesting or a new perspective on whatever idea I have. I think when you start to write things like science fiction, you, you can kind of meld concepts in a way. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you have to be at least aware that you're mixing concepts and you're kind of projecting something which doesn't necessarily exist now and might not be able to exist um, in the future. There's no other way to put it. First they turned grey, then they grew lighter and lighter. They grew lighter and fainter, and then just disappeared. And what was left was a white blank expanse spreading out in all directions. <laughs>